So the seven pillars of growth hacking. So my name is Chris Hout. I'm managing partner and lead growth hacker of Rockboost. We were the first agency here in the Netherlands that brought growth hacking from Silicon Valley. And I am super, super happy that I'm speaking here today. Because three years ago, I was working at this awful company. <laughs> Who knows this company? Yeah, a lot of people. Who thinks it's boring to work over there? <laughs> it was. So after one year, I quit my job. And this is what <laughs> happened. I was lying in my bed because I wanted to be an entrepreneur. And I didn't have any money. I didn't have a startup ID. And my girlfriend at the time thought that I was completely crazy. But I knew that within one year, we would make a shitload of money. But how much money did you think we made after one year? Zero. <laughs> so I was banging my head. But in that one year, I've got, I got an incredible gift. And the gift was that I immersed myself into a new world, in the world of growth hacking. And when I see that something has a very big opportunity, I make a deep dive. And I go deep. And what I want to share with you today are the lessons that I learned in the past three years in growing a lot of companies by using growth hacking. <coughs> so, who here is a developer? Can you raise your hand? So that's almost everybody. Who here is a business owner? Okay. So what I'm going to try to do today is to get some examples also tailored to you as developers because normally I'm only talking to marketeers, but now we're going to tailor it to developers. So growth hacking. Who of you think that growth hacking is a buzzword? Raise your hands. Why do you think it's a buzzword? Shout it out. It sounds like a buzzword. It sounds like a buzzword. It's true. A lot of people that are using this term, they're not allowed to use it. Because they've never grown a company. They've never set up something. They're basically the interns of the supermarket. And they say that they are growth hackers. But there are people who have grown companies very <coughs> fast. And I think that they, those people, they can call themselves a growth hacker. But I believe that there's one word missing within growth hacking. And that's a word that you developers must love. And if I have to put one word between growth and hacking, it's system. Growth system hacking. It sounds less, less sexy, but that is the true meaning. Because you cannot hack something if you don't have a system. Because if you look at the definition of a hack, it's finding a weak spot in a system and exploiting that weakness. But how can you exploit a weakness in marketing or in growth if you don't have a growth system? And that's what we have been developing the past years. A growth system that we use at Rockboost, the seven pillars of growth hacking. So after this 40 minutes, if a marketeer tells you to do something, you can actually challenge him with a very nice model. So what's the first thing that needs to be in place if you want to grow a company very fast? Is you need to have a certain mindset. And you have two types of mindsets. You have a growth mindset and a fixed mindset. And this is for everybody. What is a growth mindset? It means that you learn new things. You want to try new things that it's about your effort and not about your ego. That failure is an opportunity to grow. I think a lot of developers know that when they code something for the first time, it doesn't work. And then you have to learn and iterate and do it again and again until it works. For marketeers, this is a hard thing to do. Because they just throw it out and if it doesn't work, their ego is hurt. So if you have a growth mindset, it's very important that you constant get better and better. You can learn everything what you want. A challenge helps you grow. And feedback is very, very constructive. So this is the growth mindset that you need to have within a company, within a team. 
If you don't have this mindset, as a marketeer, as a CEO, or as a developer, your company or your website or your app will not grow very fast. And where did I took? Where did I find this model? It's a model by Carol Dweck, and she has developed this model by researching kids in neighborhoods that were very poor, and they teach, they learn this mindset to those children, and they were actually able to outperform the kids from the richer neighborhood. So I believe that everybody can learn this. <coughs> because I believe that if your mindset, if you change your mindset, that's always amazing when you use a keynote, if you change your mindset, you change your actions, and you change your results. This is what Growth Hacking is all about. You want to get better results. So how do you get better results? By changing the things that you do. How do you change the things that you do? By changing your mindset. That's why this is the first pillar of this model. And what I always like to do is to make my presentations very actionable. That you can go home and you know exactly what to do tomorrow. Which you probably will not do because it's weekend. So what should you do? There is a mindset survey from Carol Dweck. We will send it out to you if you register. You have weekly growth meetings with marketeers and developers. Discuss this mindset. And remove everything that, fix, that is rewarding a fixed mindset. So when somebody is, is standing there saying something and it hurts their ego, that's not a good thing. Those people, get them out of your company. Who of the developers out here can relate that a lot of marketeers have a fixed mindset? Okay, raise your hand. Some of you, okay, that's great. So the next one, the team. So what is the profile of a growth hacker? It's a person whose true north is growth. So everything that you do should be tailored to grow your company, grow your app, grow your website. So if you're developing something, you should always ask yourself, is this going to help us to grow this app or this website? To get more clients, get more customers. And what is the skill set that you need as a growth hacker? It consists of three things. So you have creative marketing, so that's learning about copywriting, designing, branding, all the stuff you guys like. You need to learn about data, analytics and testing. And an average marketeer will say, well, okay, this is something that I normally do. <coughs> but there are a lot of marketeers who just throw out something and they, don't, they do not measure and they do not test if it's working or not. And what makes a growth hacker special? That's the fact that we add a new dimension. It's the dimension of software, of programming, of coding. And on this intersection, that's the growth hacker. So a growth hacker is actually a marketeer that's also able to code. And how do you develop the skill set? That's by building a T-shape. Which means that you have to develop a broad knowledge. So you need to know a lot about a lot of different topics. And you need to have deep knowledge. So one area of expertise where you're really good at. So in this case, this is a marketeer who is very good in PPC, so in Google AdWords, and he has a lot of knowledge about other areas, which he can leverage, of course, in this area. So what I always say is that we need more Mr. T's. And I think this joke is hilarious, but it, also de it always depends on the age of the audience. Because if you show it to students, nobody will get it. <laughs> so what do you guys see here? Heineken. Heineken. Anything else? I, I don't see Heineken. I see bottlenecks. Bottlenecks over here. Of course it's beer, but I see bottlenecks. Because what do we want to do? We want to remove those bottlenecks in your skill set. So, I've shown you the T-shape, but how can you leverage your T-shape? 
So you have a certain outcome that you want to achieve, a certain result, and you have a certain skill set. And there's a bottleneck. So the question that I always ask is, on which topic or in which area do you have to read three books or follow one online course to drive more results? So ask yourself, what is blocking me currently in my day job? And what's one thing that I can learn so my output increases? And I will show you three T-shaped hacks that always work to generate more output. The first one is learning to code. So, the coders, can you raise your hand? How much easy would your life be if the people around you also knew something about code? How much? Would it be amazing? <coughs> a lot of people don't know how to code. And I think, from a company growth perspective, that's super stupid. Because the moment those people learn to code, they can go to you guys, Instead of saying, oh, it's broken, they can actually tell you, like, this script is not loading. And that will make your life way easier. And that's what I try to teach to a lot of marketers <coughs> and business owners. You need to have more people that know to code. Because then you can make the life of your developers easier. And they can work on better and more difficult stuff. Another thing. And this is maybe something that you as coders need to learn. Copywriting, if you know how to, how to write persuasive text, you can actually get more done. You can sell more. So copywriting, especially direct response copywriting, is a very good thing to learn. And this is a framework to analyze a website or an app. How good it's converting. We call this a heuristic framework, to do a heuristic analysis. And that's something that I will share with you later. But with this framework, you can go to a website, don't have any data, and already find a lot of areas where you can improve the website. So what can you do on Monday? Define the skills that you have in your broad knowledge. So what are all the areas, all the topics that you know something about? What is your deep skill? What are you really good at? And what should you learn? Which topic do you have to read three books about? Or follow one online course? Which could massively help you to generate more output in your daily work or in your business. And then we have number three, which is measurement. Because as growth hackers, we always start with one thing. The one metric that matters. So one growth goal for your company or for your marketing campaign for your app or for your website. So what Mark Zuckerberg said to his employees, our goal right now is to get 1 billion active users. And everything that we do should be tied back to this one goal. Is it helping us to get 1 billion users? So how do you get there? By generating all kinds of ideas to get to that goal. And that's not a thing that only the marketing department should do, but developers should also help in. They also have a lot of ideas which can help in the growth of the company. So we should have a process to get all the ideas from the developers also on the backlog. And then we're going to prioritize them. Using, you have different frameworks, but you should use a framework, for example, like ICE. So what's the impact on the one method that matters? Is it really going to help us? Or is it just a small idea that if it works, it's not going to move the needle very much? How confident are we about that? And how easy is it? How much resource is it? And then you're going to start testing. So you test if something works or not. And if you have tested it, you analyze if it worked or it didn't work. And that's the loop you go through every time. And the faster you can do this, the faster your company will grow. And what are other things that you should take into consideration when you're measuring? Lifetime value. So a question to the business owners over here. If I would now give you a new client, 
Who here knows what the value of the client is? How much money is the client going to generate for you over the entire lifetime? You should be able to answer this question because you cannot grow your company fast if you don't know what a new client is worth to you. Because you are buying new clients when you're doing marketing. So you need to know what the cost of acquisition is. So let's say if you sell sunglasses and you know that a client comes back three times and your total margin is 100 euro, how much money are you willing to spend for the first, for the first sale? Is it 10, 20 or 90? That will determine how fast you will grow and how much market share you can buy. So what's your cost of acquisition? And then we look to the acquisition channel in a completely different way compared to regular marketeers. Because we always try to do it on an individual level. And for that we use the pirate metrics. Who here has seen this framework before, the pirate metrics? Cool. So you can actually impress the people around you by telling about the pirate metrics. Acquisition, that's the first part. Where did we get our clients from? Was it Facebook? Was it email? Was it AdWords? Google? How did they hear about us for the first time? Activation. Are they buying or not? Do they give you their email address to create an account? And then retention. How much time are they coming back? This is where a lot of companies are losing a lot of money. Because they focus all their efforts on acquiring new companies, but they still have a shitty app, so people come not back. They don't come back. So if you want to grow fast, make sure that if you have sold some, something to someone, that they actually return and come back. And then you look at how you're monetizing your base. How are you generating revenue? And what's the referral? How many people are actually referring new people into your app or in your product? And this is something you can actually measure with knob commerce. Who knew that? When I explained this. That there was something in knob commerce that you could use. This is the customer reports. You can actually see on an individual level the amount of money something someone has generated for you. So this can actually help you in calculating the lifetime value of clients. So you can use knob commerce for that. We also use a lot of other tooling, so Google Analytics, Google Tag Manager, Kissmetrics, Hotjar, and with Hotjar you can generate heat maps of, of sites, user recordings. Who's using tools like this? Yeah, so some people, Hotjar is 9 euro a month. You can get massive insights on how people are using your site. And you can actually build improvements based on data and not on assumptions. So, the action you should take is what is your one metric that matters? So what is your growth goal? Have you calculated your lifetime value? And really discuss how much money you're willing to spend to buy a new customer. And then one of my favorite areas, listening to your market. Because if you look at the reasons why most startups fail, or why most websites don't work, or most apps, it's because of this. 42% of startups fail because they had no market need. Which basically means that they were solving a problem for someone that didn't experience that as a problem. So someone is not ill, but you still try to give him your medicine. That's not going to work. So you should always start from the customer and then do good marketing. So what should you create? It's a customer desire map. This is what you should document. So what are the hopes and dreams of people? What do they really want to achieve in life? Now if you would wake them up during the night, what is it that they really want? What do the developers really want? 
What's your hopes and dreams when you're working? No dreams? No more people that bark, that bark you when you're <coughs> typing? There's no frustration? So that's also a thing that we look at. What is a pain and fear? So what is really annoying for you? And what do you see as barriers and uncertainties? So moving away from the fear to the dream. This is something that marketeers should actually show you where you need to code something for them. Because if they haven't done their research, the thing that you're going to create is probably not going to work. And then we have product market fit. And that's the fifth pillar. And this is the first time we're going to talk about the product that you have. <coughs> because if you want to grow a company very fast, you should have product market fit. Why is that? If you don't have a fit with the market, so if, if people are not disappointed, if they cannot use your product or service anymore, you will not grow very fast. Because you get someone in, and they get out as fast as possible. So, what do you want to see is more than 40% of people that are using your app or your product should be very disappointed if they could not use it anymore. So basically ask them, okay, if I would now take it away, how disappointed would you be? And companies that grow fast have more than 40% product market fit. And what is a product? A product is the product or service that you deliver, plus all the touch points over the entire lifetime. So you could have built an amazing app as a developer, but if you have somebody at customer, at customer support who is not helping the client, that will have an impact on how they experience your app. So it's the developers that should create something amazing, but also everything around them should help them to have that amazing experience. And when you're doing a survey like this, what are you looking for? You're looking for two things. It's the aha moment. So the first moment when somebody is using your app or your website, when they're like, whoa, this is amazing. So who here knows for his own product, the moment when people are like, whoa, this app is amazing. It's very important to know. Because the more people you can get through that aha moment, the faster your app will grow. So to give you a concrete example, Facebook. What's a very important aha moment? If you have, within one week, 10 friends. They know, if you have that, that you will keep using Facebook. Which means that in the first week, you won't see ads. The only thing that they are trying to onboard you is to get you to 10 friends. Because they know that if you have 10 friends in one week, you'll keep using Facebook. So how can you tweak the product that you have built into a way that more people will go to the aha moments? And another thing that you're looking for is of course the opposite. Moments of friction. So when are people super frustrated when they're using your app or your service? Because you can grow a company very fast by getting more aha moments into your product and by removing all the friction. Because then people will give you a higher rate and you will grow faster. And actually in mob commerce, you can actually get insights where those aha moments are. So this is a report, so the popular search terms. If you know what people want, what they are looking for, then you can actually change your product based on that. So there is data in your knob commerce that can actually help you to build an experience where more people will find an aha moment. And this is a report, and it's a shame that you cannot see it, but it's the products never sold report. So many sites have so many offers that people don't buy. That could be friction. Because if people are looking at that and not at your best products, then why not remove them? Why not test if we remove those products, what will happen with the sales of our other products? 
So what's the action that you should take? Find the three aha moments of your product. So go to your back end, do a lot of analysis. When are people really happy with my product? What are the three most important points of friction? And how can you remove those points of friction? And the trick is get aha moments as early as possible in your customer journey. Because once people have experienced your aha moment, they will actually come back. And then there are only two pillars left. And this is number six, traction channels. So you have to make sure that you have product market fit. So a lot of people that come in love your product. Then it's the trick to get new customers. So a question, how many ways, how many channels are there to get new customers? Who thinks it's five or less? Raise your hand. 10 or less? More than 10. There are actually 19 different ways on how you can acquire customers. And what you see happening in a lot of industries, that they only focus on three or four channels. So they only do AdWords or SEO and some Facebook. But there are 19 different ways. And the trick is to look, what is my competition doing? What am I doing currently? And is there a channel that nobody is using yet or nobody is trying? Because if we do a test in that channel, we can actually buy customers for a very low rate. And this framework is based on a book, it's called Traction. So everybody who's interested in it, in this, I can highly recommend you to read that book. And once you have this under control, you know which channels work, you can actually play with different channels. So what we are currently doing, we are channel stacking, which means we are writing blog posts, then we are promoting those blog posts on Facebook, so that's two channels. Then when people come to our website, we get them on our email list, that's number three. If they don't end up on our email list, we retarget them, that's number four. If they are on our email list, we send them emails, and at some point we try to sell them something, if they have a good fit or not. So we have all these channels working together. And by adding them up, by stacking them, you can actually get way more profit and way more revenue out of them compared to the situation where you just use them individually. And then we have the final pillar which is optimization. So if you want to optimize something on your website, or in your app, or in your business, I can give you a very simple formula which will work 95% of the time. And the formula is this. You want to get a conversion. That's what you want. You want to sell something to someone. You want to make them buy something, get them into an account. So there are only two things that drive a conversion. The first thing is the desire. How bad do people want it? So let's do a quiz. If I would have a form with 300 fields, how many people would fill it in? Zero. If I would give you a Porsche when you do that, how many people would fill it in? Everyone, because your desire is way higher. So that's something you have to think about. Eh? How can we pump up the desire? What is it that people really want? What is Booking.com doing to pump up your desire? They are showing you only three, only three rooms left. Fifteen people have already booked here. The only reason why they are doing that is to pump up your, your desire so that you want to buy more. And once you're really good at pumping up desire, there's another thing in the formula. That's removing friction. So make it as easy as possible for people to buy. So what does Amazon do? One click buy. On booking you can buy, pay later. There is almost no friction. So if you pump up the desire as much as possible, and you remove the friction, you will sell way more stuff. But that's the thing with growth hacking. I can give you a formula. 
but there are of course always situations where the, this isn't working. So who here has booked a flight ticket online? A lot of you people, okay. So a lot of you know how systems and engineering work. How much time do you think it takes when you fill in, I want to go from Amsterdam to, let's say, London. How much time do you think it takes the computer to find the best deal? Pretty fast, right? How much time does it cost before they are showing you the result? It's most of the time it's around 30 seconds. So they are increasing friction. They are making it way more difficult for you to buy. And why are they doing that? Because by improving, by upping the friction, they are also giving a boost in your desire. Because they are showing, oh, we're now looking at KLM, at Lufthansa, at some kind of airline you never heard about. Because they want you to think that they are actually looking for you. So that's the situation where increasing friction gives you again an opportunity to also improve the desire. But just following this formula, they should just show you the result in one second. But you can actually play around with it and see what it does for your conversions. So to sum it up, and there is way more in this model, but you start with the mindset. You make sure that you have an amazing growth mindset, that you look at the T-shape of your skills, and that you actually learn your team to code, that they can work fast together, that you measure stuff, that you know what your one metric that matters is, that you know the lifetime value, that you're listening to your market, that you're doing things based on data and not on your assumptions, that you build a product and you get product market fit, so you have a product that nobody can live without. You explore the 19 different traction channels and find very creative ways, find hacks on how to get new customers. And you're constantly optimizing everything and everything. And we have developed this model. And I truly believe that if you do this, there's only one thing that can happen, that is growth and growing your company. And we from Rockboost together with our partner Dot control, we have developed this model, but we also have a giveaway for you. Because if you go to this URL, and if you like what I've been talking about today, you can actually get a free workshop. And that workshop costs normally 250 euros. It's on the 29th of November. I think there's actually a voucher in your goodie bag. So if you found this interesting, you can sign up there and we can explain you the model in way more detail and we can actually learn you how you as a developer, as a business owner, can get way more out of the things you're currently doing. I would love to hear your feedback on Twitter and thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. How many fields do you have to fill out? How many fields? <laughs> I, I honestly don't know. So, check it out. Other questions? Do you find a lot of resistance when you're saying that the market here should be more developers? Do you find a lot of resistance? That you're number one resistance area? Because I find that to be really hard in my area. I think uh, you're totally right that a lot of marketeers don't want to learn to code. They just want to do creative stuff and they don't even want to know if this worked or not. Because if it didn't work, then they're not, not allowed to do the creative stuff anymore. So we actually have developed our own system to talk with marketeers, eh, to give them insights on how they can actually get more work done by the developers if they actually learn something. And in the situations where these marketeers have actually learned to code, that actually have helped them. People that work at Rockboost need to learn to code. Even though if they never have to use it, 
they need to learn to code because when we are working on projects together with dot control, they should actually be able to communicate very fast and straight with these developers. And we have seen since the moment we have implementing that, that the speed of implementation went way up. Other questions? Yes? Don't you think that can also be something negative that the marketeer knows how to develop? Can you explain why? Because I have some development skills, I work in manage, product management, and mm -hmm. sometimes when I go to talk with developers about, as I say, bits and bytes, then sometimes they don't like me to also to give them some, some ideas because, okay, well, I'm doing my coding, you do your, your own thing. Don't you think this can also be a, an issue? I think in a lot of companies that, that is the issue. And what is truly the issue is that marketeers don't understand the world of the coders and the coders don't understand the world of the marketeer. So both sides need to learn something from each other. And once they do that, then actually the conversation starts going and they start to appreciate the input that they can give each other. So if a developer, if we would hire a developer and he doesn't want to talk with the marketeers and doesn't want to learn from them, well then it's not a good developer in my, in my perspective. You should have a growth mindset and be open to learn new things. But it's a very good question and you see that happening a lot. Other questions? Okay, thank you very much, guys.